That's not fair. <laughs> I know y'all have a good time. Uh, I don't think me or Brother Jimmy or anybody else, would look, Brother Jim, would look too good in a dress. So we better stay away from that, Brother Jim. I think we wouldn't make very good looking women. I hate to say it. So we'll leave that alone. This evening we're going to, and, and on Sunday nights for the next several weeks, we're going to do a series on the minor prophets of the Old Testament. Many times you think about the minor prophets, well, many times we don't think about the minor prophets, just to be quite honest. Uh, we begin in the book of Hosea, and we'll go all the way through the final book of the, New, of the uh, Old Testament there, and many of those names that we've seen and we don't realize, we don't recognize, <coughs> Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, some of those individuals are some of those minor prophets. Tonight we're going to begin with the book of Hosea. And as we go through these books, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time with each one of them. We're going to spend a shorter amount of time with each book because there are 12 of these books, 12 of these minor prophets. But as we go through them, we're going to learn really some important lessons, some basic lessons. Some of these books are only one chapter. Some, like Hosea, are fairly long. This is 14 chapters. So various ways that we'll approach some of these books, but... Again, we're going to begin a study of these Old Testament prophets, partly because we generally fail to. Um, sometimes this gets in the area where, you know, in the Old Testament we'll study Genesis and Exodus. We'll study some from the Proverbs, Judges, Joshua, some of those books. But then once we get in the prophets, we might look at Daniel or Isaiah a little bit, and that's generally it sometimes. So let's take some time and look at these books, and we're going to notice some specific things about Hosea. We, of course, because of time's sake, in 14 chapters, we're not going to be able to get through all of it uh, in every detail, but we're going to notice some overall themes and overall ideas. We're going to notice that Hosea is a story about love and mercy. Love and mercy. Generally, it's about God's love and mercy, but part of the love and mercy that we'll see here is even from Hosea to the wife that God commands him to marry. We'll see some rebellion. We'll see some hard-heartedness. We'll see some unfaithfulness. And then we'll see a call back to faithfulness, a call for repentance. Let's begin this book by noticing first Hosea the man. Who was this man who wrote this book? Well, as we read in the book, we don't find just a whole lot of information. It does talk about the days in which Hosea was a prophet, and it talks about who his father was, Beri. But other than that, we just don't know a whole lot. One thing we do know about Hosea is he was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel before Assyria came in and took them away to captivity. So Hosea was one of the final people to go to this northern kingdom and say, you need to repent. God's going to take you away. God's going to take everything you know away. God's going to punish you. Repent. And of course, that's generally the message of all the prophets, isn't it? Repentance, turning, changing. And you know, interestingly enough, that's really the same message we have today, isn't it? to a nation around us, a people around us, and, and to all the nations around the world. Repent, turn to God. Be obedient to Him. That will make the difference. So as we notice, the man, well, there's not just a whole lot to know, but we do know that he was a prophet of the northern kingdom. And we recognize that he prophesied in the middle 700s B.C., uh, right before the captivity which began in 722. B.C. when Assyria came in and took over the northern kingdom of Israel. So the man, just a very basic outline, some basic information. Next, let's notice the marriage. This book begins dealing with a marriage. A marriage that was set up by God. A marriage that was for a specific purpose. Let's notice beginning in verse 2 what it says here. It says, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and I recognize I might be saying that differently than some say it. You might say Hosea. That's all right. No big deal. Um, we're not going to split hairs over that. But beginning the word of the Lord by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, go and take unto thee a wife of whoredoms, 
and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. As we look at this, we notice this marriage that God wanted Hosea to enter into. If um, any of you have grandchildren that are on the way, nieces or nephews on the way, recommend that they, if it's a girl, name them Gomer. See how that works. Doesn't work too well. But that was the name of Hosea's wife. God said, go and take you a wife of whoredoms, children of whoredoms. This can be taken a couple of different ways. Some say that uh, the woman that Hosea married was, was a prostitute. Some say that she was from others, she was a child of prostitutes. She was around prostitution and uh, the business that it was. Um, people can split hairs and talk about that in different ways. I've got my thoughts, but here's the point of it. God wanted this marriage to take place for a purpose, as a sign. And as we notice more about this marriage, we're going to see that this marriage goes along with the attitude that Israel had toward its husband, its groom, which would have been God. So he was to take this wife of whoredoms, talks about children of whoredoms, and it says that he went and found Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived, it says, and bare him a son. And God begins to talk about these children and and these children that Hosea had with Gomer, he names them for them. And we notice there it says, The Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Here we see that God is telling Hosea, and describing this son here, he's telling Hosea, look, here's what's going to happen. You're going to call this son this name. And of course, especially in Hebrew culture, names meant something. Today we name people something because it sounds good to us. But every name that we see in the Old Testament had some specific meaning, especially names that were given by God. So he said, call him Jezreel, because here's what's going to happen. I'm going to cause the kingdom of the house of Israel to cease. In other words, it's no longer going to be a kingdom. It's a pretty powerful statement, isn't it? God telling Hosea, telling Israel through Hosea, I'm going to stop this kingdom. Why was God going to end this kingdom? Why was He going to bring it to a, a, a point where it stopped? Well, of course, we read in the previous verse, in verse 2 up there, it says, the land, the people, had committed that whoredom. They had departed from the Lord. They were unfaithful to God. Then it goes down in verse 6, and it says, And she conceived again, and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Loruhamah. That's an interesting name, isn't it? Loruhamah. For I will no more have mercy upon the people, excuse me, upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Laruhamah. The name simply means no mercy. No mercy. Or sometimes no love. Because these people, Israel, had departed from God, God is prophesying and using these children that Hosea has to, to be examples to show that I'm no longer going to have mercy upon you unless you turn, unless you turn from your evil ways. Verse 7, it says, But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. And when she had weaned Laruhama, she conceived and bare a son. So God is talking about these two nations, and He says, Israel is so wicked, I'm going to cut it off. It's going to be cut off now. I'm not going to have mercy on Israel. Judah I'm going to have mercy upon. Now what's interesting is Judah was not taken into captivity for almost another 150 years after Israel was taken into captivity. 
Another interesting thing is, as you study the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, and you go down these long list of these kings, Judah actually had some good kings. Israel had no kings that were described by God as being good. So we see how their wickedness just increased and increased and increased to the point that God said, no more. The Old Testament uses a figure of speech. It talks about God's cup of wrath. And you think about a cup or a glass. And this image, this figure of speech is used to show God's wrath going into this cup going into this cup, going into this cup, and finally this cup being able to hold no more. And it describes that cup of wrath being poured out on the people. That had happened to Israel. That had happened to the northern kingdom. God had had enough. So it was time to take away their mercy. He was going to put them in captivity. But Judah, they're going to have mercy because there is some, some faithfulness there, although it would continue to de decrease. So verse 9 it says, after it talks about that daughter, Laruhamah, it says, Then said God, call his name Loamai, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, shall come to pass, that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are, my, ye are the sons of the living God. So he's talking here about the fact that they're going to be wiped away. They're no longer going to be God's people. There was a time coming where the physical Jews would not continue to be God's people. Well, let's think about today for just a minute. Who are God's people today? Is it the physical Jews? Those who claim Jewish heritage? Well, we read in the Bible who the children, the true children of God are, the true faithful of God, the people of God, the church, Christians. Those who have been obedient to the gospel are those today. So there would always be a people of God. But these people would stop being God's people. Now something interesting that I don't know from the text, but in studying about this book uh, that you find sometimes is it, it's possible that God uses this example of Loamai as someone who he described as Israel was no longer his people because, and this is just conjecture and I'm going to give it to you and leave it there. Some people assume or make the idea that Loamai was not actually Hosea's child. You're not my people. The name means not my son, not my child. So... Don't know. Is that true? I don't know. It's an interesting point. You might want to study it sometime. Uh, some of those points are interesting and can give us some, some study thoughts, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. God was going to take away these people. They were no longer going to be His. So as we look at this, this is a marriage that started out, no matter what you believe about whether she was already a prostitute or she would later go into prostitution, already in difficult position. This marriage was difficult. And the children that came into it were given difficult names by God. We later find out that, and we don't have time to go into great detail about it, but we later find out that Gomer was unfaithful. Was unfaithful to Hosea. And finally, Hosea had to come to Gomer and plead with her and rebuke her for her actions and plead with her to come back. And she did. And God uses this, these are real events that happened. He uses these real events to make a parallel and to describe the relationship that he had with Israel. Just like Gomer had turned away and gone to other men, Israel had gone away and turned to other gods. Well, God doesn't take too highly to that, does He? Does he? As a matter of fact, when we read the Ten Commandments, the first two explicitly state, no other gods before me, you don't make any graven images of anything in heaven, the earth, or the waters under the earth. So we see here that <laughs> clearly they had turned away from God just like Gomer had turned away from Hosea. Yet as Hosea went to Gomer and begged her to come back, rebuked her for her actions, so God is coming to Israel and saying, please come back to me. Please be a part of me again. So, the marriage. Let's notice the meaning. 
and we've kind of talked about it already. God is using the situation, the true real life situation that Hosea and Gomer were in to describe and help illustrate Israel's wickedness. And what's also interesting about that is Later in the book of Romans, we read there that in chapter 7 that the husband is bound to the wife as long as she lives and the wife is bound to the husband as long as she lives. But when death enters, the other one is free to remarry. You say, well, how does that connect? In the Old Testament, we read that Israel, and when I say Israel, let me say it this way, because you had the northern kingdom of Israel, the lower kingdom of Judah, the entire nation, both nations together, the entirety of the people were unfaithful and wicked. There was only a small remnant that remained faithful. And because the entirety of the nation were wicked, because God has always allowed a separation or divorce for the cause of fornication, because they were wickedness and unfaithful in that relationship, Christ died and was able to bring in a new covenant. Now that's kind of interesting. You say, Will, you're, you're going way, way too far into it. I don't read that. Well, that's why these Old Testament prophets are so interesting because we find bits and pieces. Of course, you could go back to Jeremiah and read more about that relationship and how God called Israel His people, but because they were unfaithful, He was going to put them away. But that's the relationship that they had and that's the problem that Israel had. But God's begging them and pleading with them, come back to me, please come back to me. Don't stay in the wickedness that you're in. And He even goes on to describe their wickedness. Just like Jesus did in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. Where He said, I, I know you've had five husbands. The person you're with now is not even your husband. And, and He knew her situation. God is explaining their situation to them and begging them to come back. And in chapter 14, we even read about the fact that God is begging them to return. And we see, and even in history, we see that for a very short time, Israel put off the captivity that was going to happen just for a short period of time. Finally, they turned back over to their wicked ways and they uh, gave in to the idolatry and other problems that they had. And God had to allow them to be taken into captivity. But for a short period of time, they turned away. And God even talks about the fact that if they will turn, and, and He says they will, I'll heal them, I'll help them, and I'll make them my people again. That's the meaning of the whole book. And I know that's very short and sweet and to the point, so to speak. But I want to notice very quickly the messages. The messages. And as we notice some of the messages here, we're going to go to some specific verses that might even ring in your ears. You might say, hey, I've heard that one. I know that one. And we're going to go to some of these verses and see their significance in the time and then the significance today. Let's begin by noticing chapter 4 and verse 6. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. This is a passage we use to talk about the importance of study and learning and growing in our knowledge of what God wants us to be, and rightly so. But let's notice the context of it. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I'll reject thee. Thou shalt be no more priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I will also forget thy children. Here God's telling them, you have allowed the knowledge of idols to enter into your mind and you failed to remember the knowledge of me. They had put God out of their minds. And you know, that's what we do when we fall into wickedness and sin, don't we? It's hard for us to sin when we have God in our minds and in our consciences. But when we pull God out of our minds and out of our conscience, out of our thinking, when we pull God out, it's easier to sin. Well, they had taken God out, taken the knowledge and the understanding of God out, and they had begun to follow after these idols. God said, because you've rejected the knowledge that I've given you, I'll reject you. You're not going to be a priest for me anymore. You've forgotten the law of your God. And because of that, your children, He says, I will forget your children. He doesn't mean by that that you're wicked and your children are going to be cut off completely because of it. The idea is they're going to suffer for your wickedness. 
because these people, children, ch these people's children were the ones that went into captivity in Assyria. Your children are going to be punished for your actions, which is important for us to remember. <laughs> Some people say we're not an island. In other words, what we do affects other people around us. Our actions affect our children. Our actions might affect generations far to come. We have to be careful. We have to make sure that we're looking to God and keeping God where He should be and make the application today. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We need to keep God in our knowledge and in our understanding. Let's also notice chapter 4 and verse 11. It says, Their whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. Sin gets into our minds and into our hearts. And sin wants to take us away from God. And that's why we have to be so careful and so cautious. If you've ever gotten caught up in some type of sin in your life, gotten, become unfaithful, gotten away from the Lord, you realize that it only took small steps to drag you away. And then you look up and you see where you are and you say, how did I get here? I didn't mean to be here. I, I meant to be faithful to God. I just was, you know, got caught up a little bit. And that's how sin does us. Sin takes us so much further than we want to go. And it holds us longer than we want to be with it. So we have to be careful of that. Another verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 17. This chapter is full of great verses. Look what it says, chapter 4 and verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Listen to what God says. Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. That's a difficult situation to think about, isn't it? For God, because of someone's wickedness, for someone turning away from Him, He says, leave them alone. And that's a biblical principle that we find in the New Testament. Do you remember, well, even specifically in a time where we talk about uh, the limited commission, Matthew chapter 10? Do you remember what Jesus told His disciples as they went out into various towns and into places? And He says, if they don't receive you, knock the dust off of your feet and move on. In other words, leave them alone. If they're not going to receive you, if they're not going to listen to you, leave them alone. In, chapter, in Romans chapter 1, we read about a time in the Gentile world when God gave those people up to their wickedness and their idolatry and He gave them up to their uh, ungodly lives. He gave them up. We don't want to get in that situation, do we? Where God looks at us in our life and He says, leave them alone. They've, they've taken the action they want to take. Leave them alone. We don't want to be there. Let's notice chapter 8 and verse 7. Chapter 8 and verse 7. It says, Therefore they have sown to the wind. They shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If, it, if so be it yield... The stranger shall swallow it up. Sometimes when people are younger, we talk about the idea that they are sowing their wild oats. Oh, they're just in a stage. They're sowing their wild oats. They'll get over that after a while. We have to be careful about that. Because what we mean by that is they're just sowing to whatever and wherever. They're sowing to the wind. What do we do? What does it say here we do when we sow to the wind? What's the harvest that we're going to receive? You see, the harvest that we're going to receive when we sow to the wind is something we don't want. It's a whirlwind. It's going to grab us and take hold of us and make us unable to do the things we want to do. It talks about that whirlwind. If we sow to the wind, we receive that whirlwind. It doesn't have a stalk. It doesn't yield anything good. You're not going to get anything from it. And again, we talk about young people sometimes and we say, it's all right, they're just sowing their wild oats. Listen, during that period of time that we give them some leeway and say they're sowing their wild oats, they destroy their lives. And they spend the rest of their time trying to correct those things and get over those things that they had to get into because we said, well, they're just, you know, they're just doing what they do. If you sow to the wind, you reap a whirlwind. That's true back then, that's true today. We have to be careful of it. Chapter 10 and verse 2. Uh, excuse me, verse 12. Chapter 10 and verse 12. 
He talks about not sowing to the wind so we receive a whirlwind. What do we sow? Well, He told them, Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground or your untouched ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till He come and rain righteousness upon you. Now, isn't this a complete 180 from what He was just talking about? If you sow to the wind, you're going to receive a whirlwind. And nothing that comes from that is going to be any good. But if you sow to yourself righteousness, if you sow the seed of righteousness, listen to what you're going to get. You're going to get mercy. If you break up your ground, that ground that's been untouched, break it up. Seek God. And what does it say He's going to do? And this is amazing. It says, Till He come and rain righteousness upon you. That's the harvest I want. Isn't it the harvest you want? Chapter 12 and verse 6. Chapter 12 and verse 6. It says, Therefore turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on God continually. What a great bit of advice to them. Of course, they were in need of turning. But what a great bit of advice for us. We need to make sure that we're staying with God. That we're living lives for God and if we get away from Him that we turn back to Him. We need to make sure we're keeping mercy and judgment and waiting on God continually. We talk about that idea of waiting on God. Uh, we read in the book of Isaiah, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. When we think about that, we have to understand we're, we need to do it God's way. We let God lead. We do it God's way. When He says do it, we do it that way. We don't, it's not our job to question. It's not our job to say, well, what about this and what about that? It's simply our job to follow Him. And He'll lead us in the right way. And finally, let's notice the last verse that we're going to have time for here. Chapter 14 and verse 4. Here God is talking about the idea that if they repent, what will He do? He says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. And mine anger, for mine anger is turned away from him. That's interesting because in the previous verse it says, Asher shall not save us. We will not ride upon her. Asher, Assyria, the kingdom of Assyria. They're not going to come in, God says, to save you. That's not the point of it. They're not coming in to save you. They're going to come in and destroy you. But God says, I'll heal you. I'll heal you. I'll, I'll love you. And I'll turn my anger from you. But there's a condition on that, isn't it? You've got to turn. You've got to repent. You've got to be the people that I want you to be. Hosea is, and we could go into a whole lot of other details, a wonderful book. Take the time to read it. I believe the account there of Hosea and Gomer really bring all of the ideas to life for us. Because we see a husband and wife, the husband wants so, so much for this relationship to be what it should be, the wife goes on and does what she wants to. The husband has to come and beg her back, please, please come back to me. You know you've done wrong. Come back to me. Be with me again. And it's the perfect mirror image of what God's doing to Israel. God's loved Israel. He wants Israel to do well, but they've turned away from Him. So he comes back to, the, to them in the form of Hosea and also Amos. Amos is another person who prophesied in the same period of time to the same people. He used those individuals to come to them and say, please come back to me. Please repent. Please return to the way you were when you followed me and you loved me. And if they would do that, they would be accepted again. But of course, we know the end of the story. They didn't. They might have for a short time, but they didn't continue to keep it that way. In the New Testament, we read an example of a church, the church of Ephesus. Paul wrote at least one letter that we know of to the church in Ephesus. That church had some of the greatest preachers the New Testament ever knew. Apollos, Quill and Priscilla, Paul, Timothy had those individuals that were preachers from time to time for them. They had so much going for them. But in Revelation chapter 2, 
Jesus writes to them through the hand of John. You've left your first love. And because you've left me, I'm going to come and take away your candlestick. What he means by that is you're not going to be my people anymore. Let's make sure that we remember and we recognize that as long as we are on God's side, God's on ours. But if there's any point in our life when we're not on God's side, it's not because He left and it's not because He's trying. It's because we failed to do what was right and we turned our back on Him. Tonight we have to look at ourselves and ask the question, are we being faithful to God? Are we doing what we should? Or are we like that wife Gomer who's given herself over to, to uh, wickedness, prostitution? Are we like that? You see, we don't like to see ourselves like that, do we? But sometimes we have to be honest and be real and say, I'm living in a way that I shouldn't live. God gives us a simple answer to that. Turn back to Him. It might be that tonight you're a child of God, but you haven't lived for Him. Turn back to Him. Turn back to Him. And like uh, last week, Tony mentioned in his sermon, as we talk about the prodigal son, if you'll come back to Him, He'll embrace you and He'll love you down. What a wonderful idea that God loves us so much that when we get there, when we turn back to Him, when we run back His direction, He'll run ours and He will love us down. Might be you're not a child of God, I don't know. Maybe you haven't done what you should to become one by being immersed in water for the remission of your sins. Let's take care of that tonight. Whatever your spiritual need is, let's, let's, let's work together. Because at the end of the day, if we're not in heaven, it's our fault. And we haven't made those arrangements. You know, just like you have to make an arrangement at a hotel, there are arrangements to be made in heaven. It's often called a prepared place for a prepared people. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Is that reservation that He's making for us? I hope so. If it might be that you look up and tonight and say, I don't know if it is or not, let's make sure it is before you leave. The opportunity is now. The song's been selected. If you will come to the front while we stand and sing, you'll have that opportunity. So please come.